Hey everybody, we are back with Brandon Aker, once again, the incredibly talented Brandon Aker. Oh, and he's not here with the Theorbo today, though we actually are because we're filming another video. Mm -hmm. um, but today we're gonna be talking about the Baroque guitar. What are we looking at? The Baroque guitar is a 17th century version, so those yeah. 1600s, yeah. version of the guitar. Kind it's... of the predecessor to the modern guitar. Yeah. If you were a guitarist, in the 1600s, this is what you would be playing. This is what you would yeah. know and love. And it's almost like the guitar that we know. Like if I pick it up now, yeah. and then at first if you just look at it, it's a bit intimidating. because How, how many strings does this have? So there's actually nine strings. but This is a nine string. It's a nine string. So if you're a guitarist in the 1600s, you play a nine string. That's not a n totally a new <laughs> thing. Like nine string guitars were standard in the 1600s. Exactly right. But the thing is, we don't think of them as nine strings. Mm -hmm. So it's important to actually call this a five course guitar, course being a pair of strings. So when I play this instrument, I think I have five strings and four of them are doubled, like a 12 string guitar. So in, in essence, it's like, take the six string that, you know, E to E, mm -hmm. get rid of the low E, yep. and then double up all the strings except for the uh, high E. Correct. So the high E has a really special name. It's called the chanterelle, mm -hmm. which is French, which means the singing string. If you make the high E single, it makes it brings out the melody of that string a bit more. How it compares to a regular guitar, uh -huh. we have no low E, yep. then two A's. High A's. Two an high octave A's. higher than Oh, you're the right. Guitar. So there is no low A. I at, didn't at realize in, that. In this tuning, yeah. Octave higher than a normal guitar. Yeah. Two A's, and then two octaves of D. Yep. One of them being the one we're used to, then G, two G's. Two G's. Two B's. Yep. And one E. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. all lutes and instruments of this period that had this double stringing always kept the first one, the chanterelle single. Mm -hmm. Similar, yeah, it's like... You can hear it stands out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so all the other strings, a to B here are doubled and it's the D that has the octave. It's nice that there is, like I can strum it just with the same muscle memory that I have a regular guitar, but yeah. there's all these different textures for each string that I'm used to because they're either doubled up with the same note, doubled up an octave, or just single. It really changes the way you play. And if you mm -hmm. play the music that was written for it, you'll see they took full advantage of that sound. One of the hardest things about playing this instrument coming from single string guitars is having to play both strings at the same time. Yeah. Because you, as a guitarist, you really end up going. So I'm actually only plucking one. You have to learn how to touch both strings at the mm -hmm. same time. Like strum through with the thumb. That's a very different sound, right? Especially if they're the octaves. Yeah, just like a 12 string. You know, or. <laughs> gives you that cool Arabic vibe, yeah, you know? It's awesome. Plane. Plane. Behind you in your shot. Hopefully, that's like out of focus at least. It's not. It's not at all. Uh oh. Yeah, that's just filming outside for you, I guess. Of course. Do you happen to know when they added the low E and when did they stop doubling the strings? Yeah, it seems like it happened just before uh, 1800. The, the instruments were slowly transitioning and um, I've, I've heard good, a good argument for the sixth string becoming sort of codified and becoming a standard. 1800. Around 1800. Yeah, just the beginning of the 19th century. And do you know why they made that change to the guitar? Why did they add the low E? It might sound like a weird thing if you start with the Baroque guitar and then say, why did someone have the idea to add the low, the low E? But just back up a couple hundred years, they had five or six course instruments and they just the trend was to, how many low basses can we fit on this thing? <laughs> they just kept <laughs> So that's not new on. at all. I've seen your videos with the, all these low strings. Yeah. I'm like, he's basically shredding on a loop. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder if it was somewhat of a joke at the time too. I don't think it's much, it, it's as funny as it is like, they wanted the low bass. Mm -hmm. Playing. Because what would accompany this on the bass side at the time? Would it be the theorbo? Was that a regular instrument to accompany this? You can do theorbos with guitars. You can have uh, cellos and cello-like instruments bowing the low bass. Especially in the 17th century, what we call the Baroque period, the bass is so important. In fact, they kind of thought of music from the bass up. And so you need this very boom, which the theorbo we found out in the last video gives us. Mm -hmm. Do you know at what time they stopped doubling the strings as well? And why did they make that decision? I've read that at the same time around that they added the low six string, they also started moving things to single strings uh, as being the standard because it's a little bit easier to be more uh, precise and virtuosic, uh, which fit the music of the time. The early 19th century 
early romantic music, we can call it, no longer Baroque. The it was more strings. technical, so they wanted to use the single It's not that it's more, more technical, technical, it's that they were using different techniques that the early romantic music required was more well suited to single strings. It it's also getting, easier to tune. That it's would... easier to tune. They also started going with uh, steel frets, because you remember I have these gut frets mm -hmm. that I can slide around and change. But for And that are kind of wearing a bit as, yeah. as you play. These are gut. These are gut. People find it weird. They show up to my house and all of a sudden I have all these bags of intestines. <laughs> <laughs> and this intestine yeah. is at this thickness and yeah. this one. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, you, you collect all different gauges of this material and it's, it gets really technical how you can tie it on yourself and, and find the right size. You know, mm -hmm. if you have like a, if you have metal frets, you, it's really hard to change them. You have to file yeah. them oh, down. Yeah. This I can just cut it off and tie a different one on. Mm -hmm. But by 1800, we certainly start getting more metal frets and uh, single strings. That, that just was the trend. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the one that persisted until... What, what we know the guitar of now. Exactly right. What makes this instrument sound so special is what we're talking about, that double stringing. Because you can do really cool things uh, because it actually doesn't go low to high. There's kind of this inside-outside thing, kind of like a ukulele. Mm -hmm. And actually, this is kind of where the ukulele tuning comes from. Really? I, I've heard from, from actually the younger brother of this instrument, the Renaissance guitar, it's tuned just like a ukulele. Yeah. It's with that higher yeah. string up top. Yeah. The cool thing about it is instead of playing scales like... We can go... Or... Because <laughs> each string has its different texture with them being either doubled up or doubled up with an octave or... It's a plains. You're a particular type of musician that plays instruments from hundreds of years ago to mm -hmm. the best accuracy. What is that? What is that called? You can call me an early musician. An early or musician. A yeah. specialist in early instruments. Someone who's interested in and what's called hip, actually, historically really? informed performance. <laughs> <laughs> It is hip. It's super hip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's another thing that's really fascinating about this to me is you pick it up and you play it and you feel this connection to guitarists from the 1600s. I think I love, of this as sort of like musical archaeology. Yeah. It's a really cool experience when you you look at this manuscript and you're like, has anyone even seen this for 400 years? Has anyone yeah. played this? And when you play it, you're like, it's kind of new music in a way because it's so old that it's been rediscovered. How do you study that music? Because you have the sheet music, I'm sure. Yeah. Is that enough? You have to use your musical intuition, but you can read all these texts and things, sometimes in the preface to like a book of their music. Do they have descriptions of their playing style as Sometimes technique? they talk about it and sometimes they say things like, put your pinky down on the instrument, um, you know, and like play halfway between the bridge and the rose, which is what we call this. That's the sound they want, and you know you can look at paintings to advise you as well. In the paintings, when you see Baroque guitars, they always strum here, which gives a really soft sound. That sort of sound. And then when they pluck, they always put their pinky down by the bridge, and they pluck down here. And you have the fingernails for that too. Yeah, so the, the nails thing is kind of interesting. So we know that some people played with nails and some people didn't. And no one played with guitar picks at this time. Uh, earlier they did. In the earlier? Period, huh? They played with like eagles, quills, uh, as plectrums. Yeah. Pretty, a pretty cool pick, yeah. actually. <laughs> pretty metal. Pretty metal. So you use those paintings as a reference yeah. for your, your playing technique. Now we got cicadas too. Yeah. So. You'll never know how accurate you are because we don't have any recordings yeah. in the 1600s. I think the earliest recording is like just a little bit before, was it in the early 1900s or something? Very recently. Far after these were first created. Exactly. And do you know playing? It's like Wayne's World. But in the end of the day, uh, there's always a mixture of the hip part, the historically informed part for what you can uh -huh. read. And then there's a mixture of what works for our aesthetic. One thing that I think every musician has to do is be as informed as possible, and then you try to make things sound good and, and do what they want most of all. <laughs> we got an ice cream truck. <laughs> want to just go inside? We should probably just go yeah. inside. You want to change clothes too? Yeah, yeah, let's change clothes. Okay, let's change clothes. Here we can try a, a Baroque song. Oh, nice drum. Yeah. There you go. I learned that from doing slap bass. Nice. <laughs> so, so instead of like a, you know, normally you're supposed to hit it with your 
sure. uh, with your fingernail. Yeah. But from playing bass, I'm yeah. just hitting it like with the meaty part of my finger. So it's almost like that type of thing in reverse. That's great. Yeah. So it's not as percussive, <laughs> but I still get like 90% of the way there. Let's try a broke tune. <laughs> G, G, C, yeah. D, G. I love this thing. I absolutely love it. That's not great. Right now you're you're shredding uh, over uh, broke pieces. It's so great. <laughs> it's also it's so in the spirit of what it's supposed to be. Actually, mm -hmm. these pieces were just you know fun chord progressions, and you just, what can you do on top of it? You mm -hmm. know? What's funny I love about the Theorbo is once you get used to the guitar playing, there's some mm -hmm. pieces that sound really good, <laughs> like um, what's it? Uh, Wow, yes. Beautiful. That's, what, great I think that's the though. first finger picking song that I learned. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Are we rolling? Yeah, it's all rolling. Take these broken wings and learn to fly. This has that, uh, just this incredible sound that I'm not totally used to, yeah. but a fretboard that I totally understand. Exactly. Yeah. The other really cool thing about the Bro yeah. guitar is you can't miss it, is the sound hole decoration. I had this guitar made for me by this amazing luthier in Spain named Julio Castaños, and he showed me the goat skin where that came from. That's goat skin. Really? Yeah. And his wife, Mariana, designed this. Uh, the decoration for me. So it's three dimensional. Mm -hmm. We call it like a reverse wedding cake rose. And uh, again, purely aesthetic, but it's so gorgeous. What I love also is the, the mustache bridge. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> All the woodwork he did is so incredible. If you flip around the guitar, the back, he just, for looks, he just added this extra strip of maple in there among all the rosewood. I mean, just that is, is so beautiful. And uh, up top, you can see all this beautiful 
layers of fine detail. It's just gorgeous. These tuning pegs are really interesting too. Again, just friction. Yeah, but they work beautifully actually, which is an amazing process watching them, you know, fit the pegs. It's incredible. Oops, jeez. This okay. thing. It's made wow, to be hit actually. You right actually now. slap this guitar, you hit it a lot and make oh, really? full effect. Yeah, they kind of like, on the, yeah. Granted, I'm gonna get some coffee. Thanks again to our sponsor, Trade Coffee. You can get 30% off your first bag of coffee by using the link below and using the coupon code Rob Scallon. Now, Fran Brandon, where are you going? All right. Well, thanks for being on my channel again. Hey, man. Thank you so much. <laughs> if you guys would like to check out Brandon's channel, it is right here. If you'd like to subscribe to my channel, that's here as well. Here's some other videos we've done like this. And if you didn't see the one we did on the Theorbo, you should really check that out. Check it out. Also, the music video we shot today with the Theorbo and this. Uh, it was a really good representation of those two instruments. Uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Thanks so much for watching. See ya.